14th Annual Collaboration for Entrepreneurship, ACE 14. This year's event can truly be called a celebration of entrepreneurship. We have 30 different entrepreneurial support organizations that are involved. We had a registration of about 1,000 people uh, that have been here or are planning to attend this evening. Um, I'd like to kick off this evening by thanking the um, ACE Planning Committee. Believe it or not, we work uh, most of the year on this event. Uh, we start in the late summer and just keep going. So if I could, if uh, my ACE Planning Committee folks could raise their hands so that we can acknowledge your hard work. Thank you. <laughs> I'd also like to thank our uh, many panelists, uh, moderators, experts serving in the consultants corridor, our elevator pitch uh, judges that you'll be meeting shortly, um, our award presenters and exhibitors. Uh, your sharing your expertise with us really brings this event alive. And a special thank you to our keynote speaker, who you'll be hearing from in a few minutes, Peter Bloom, who has traveled from the East Coast to be with us. And I'd also like to thank again uh, this year Chris Holman, who will be emceeing our ele elevator pitch competition. Chris brings a very unique and uh, vital energy to ACE every year. Since gathering last January, I've been really impressed with how our ecosystem has continued to evolve and grow and how smart we've been about uh, developing new programs for our entrepreneurs across the state. I think uh, most of you have probably noticed that we have many more experiential types of programs like i and Activate that have been uh, launched in the recent year or two. And very exciting developments in our angel uh, network community and some of our private uh, programs like Bizdom and Start Garden that are helping a lot of our entrepreneurs. Um, there's some clear changes in the air. Uh, we've seen uh, some today. If you were involved with the uh, New Enterprise Forum uh, panels, you'll know that they did a pitch pit this afternoon, and that's something that they're modeling to use in their uh, format for New Enterprise Forum monthly meetings. The MIT Enterprise Forum, which is the other founding partner of this uh, ACE event, is also um, planning some very different changes for the year. And later this evening, you'll hear about my own exciting news about my quest and how we're leveraging the strengths of GLEQ and the Small Business Foundation of Michigan. Now it's my pleasure to turn over the podium to Eric Sosenko uh, to in introduce our keynote speaker. Eric is an intellectual property attorney with Brinks, Gilson, and Leon. He's one of our sponsors this evening, and uh, uh, he's a bit of a legal celebrity. Just uh, last year, in 2013, Eric was named uh, one of the top lawyers in the Detroit area by D Business, and he was identified as an IP star by Managing Intellectual Property Magazine. So, Eric, if I can turn things over to you. Thanks, Diane. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you the ACE 14 keynote speaker, Peter Bloom. Peter is currently an advisory director at General Atlantic, which is a global growth equity firm. For the past 15 years, Peter has been managing director, uh, and he led the firm's global technology due diligence on prospective investments. He provided technology and risk management assistance to the CEOs and senior management teams of the portfolio companies. He also provided guidance on emerging technologies for the company as well as its stakeholders and several private and public entities. He is also a member of the Risk Management Committee of Gavilon, one of the world's largest agricultural trading firms which conducts business in over 25 countries. He is a technology and a board advisor to Getco, a leading electronic market maker which actively engages in 50 financial markets globally. Also, he's a director of Pasur Aerospace, which specializes in analytic services and business intelligence for the airline industries and airports based on advanced signal processing technologies. Prior to General Atlantic, Peter spent 16 years at Solomon Brothers in a variety of roles, 
including both technology and fixed income sales and trading. As managing director of Solomon's U.S. technology division, he led the team that was responsible for recovering the trading capabilities of 11 firms following the bombing of the World Trade Centers in 1993. While at Solomon Brothers, he received the Carnegie Mellon AMS Achievement Award in Managing Information Technology. He has served as a member of the New York Electronic Crimes Task Force, a judge for the Lemelson MIT Invention Awards, a judge for the Legatum Fortune Technology Prize, and was a founding member of the BP Digital and Communications Technology Advisory Board, as well as the New School for Social Research Technology Advisory Board. Peter is also an active member of the Business Executives for National Security, is on the FCC Technical Advisory Council, is an advisor to various U.S. government entities on security-related security related tech uh, issues, and serves on several public, private, and nonprofit boards. Currently, he is the chairman of DonorsChoose.org, which was named the most innovative charity in America by the Stanford Business School. He is also the co-founder and chairman of Peak Rescue Institute which teaches advanced rescue skills to first responders. Finally, he is a board member for the Food Bank of New York City, uh, a board member for the Cancer Research Institute, the Connected Warrior Foundation, and is an associate founder of Singularity University. Peter was raised in Binghamton, New York, graduated from Northwestern University, and currently resides in Brooklyn. Uh, you may think that Peter does not have any spare time after all that. Well, in 1987, Peter took a vacation, not like I think any vacation I've ever heard of before, Peter. Uh, Peter and his wife retraced Napoleon's route from Poland to Moscow on their tandem bicycle. Lest you think Peter is Superman, I just want to let you know. He only did it one way, and he did not do it in winter. With that, Peter Bloom. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Is this mic on? Thank you. That was such a great introduction. I really appreciate it. Let me just bring up my presentation here. This is the advantage of having been in the AV team in junior high school while everyone else was learning to play baseball. <laughs> um, I should say, by the way, that I really appreciate the invitation, but uh, <clears throat> my first job out of Northwestern was on Big Beaver Road at the Kmart headquarters. So I kind of feel like I'm coming home. So I'm really glad to be here. And that's one of the jobs I'm really proud of, but I felt it probably wouldn't really fit in the, uh, in the introduction. You know, there's such a diverse audience. I'm just curious, how many of you are active entrepreneurs right now? Just raise a show of hands. Oh, so a significant number. How many of you are active investors in entrepreneurial companies? Also a significant number. How many are aspirational entrepreneurs who are planning to do something entrepreneurial? So the challenge for me is it's such a broad group. You have such a deep level of expertise in so many subjects. I'm not going to try and tell you how to do what you already know how to do. I'm going to try and create a framework from my own experience of <clears throat> working with entrepreneurs and investors. And the way I'm going to do that is I want to talk to you about four of my entrepreneurial heroes and a lesson that I learned from each of them that has really informed my own thinking about being an entrepreneur and being an investor. Uh, but to do that, I want to start in the 15th century. So I want, to, I want you to put, your own, put yourself in the shoes of someone in the 15th century who wants to be an entrepreneur. And who was that person? Probably a sea captain. And think about what a sea captain had to do. They looked out. The world was flat. They saw this boundary. They had no idea what was on the other side. And they would bring a map maker with them. And they would sail over the edge of the earth. They would sail over that boundary, that area between what they knew <clears throat> and what they didn't know. And of course, if they were traveling by land, they could only go as far as a horse would go. We're going to get back to that horse in a second. So the reality of the fact for this entrepreneur, this sea captain, was every time they came home with a new map, they had expanded the boundaries of what was known. This is Stevenson's rocket. So Stevenson's rocket was launched in 1830, and it was a big deal when it was launched. And the reason it was a big deal, uh, this was the, basically the beginning of the transportation age. 
This was the fastest vehicle that had ever been invented by man. Much faster than a horse, by the way. So it won't surprise you that William Huskinson, who was Secretary of State for War in the Colonies, went to the launch of Stevenson's rocket. Uh, it was a big deal. There were bunting and balloons, and the rocket was coming. So uh, how many people have ever heard of William Huskinson? So he's really famous. He's the first person killed by a train. <laughs> he was run over by Stevenson rocket the day it was launched. <laughs> and here's what happened. He was, no one can really be sure of this, but he was in an argument. He turned around. The train was coming. He'd never seen anything move faster than a horse. He could not perceive how fast the train was coming. It ran over him, and it killed him. So what I would argue was he was in a boundary condition just like that sea captain, right, between the known and the unknown. He just didn't know he was in the boundary condition. And so I want to talk about entrepreneurial boundary conditions because if you think about these companies that we all know so well now that seem so amazing, and I'm not going to go through them. Everyone in this room recognizes every one of them. I just want you to think about one thing. Every one of them made a tremendous contribution at the boundary between what we knew before they existed and what we know now. Each one of these companies kind of drew a new map. And that's kind of how I feel about a lot of you in this room is, you know, you, many, many people in this room know a lot about things that I don't know anything about. But every one of you has a clear sense of, what I know and what you know and the boundary between us. Now, um, if you have a pencil and paper, I'm going to give you a quiz because the other thing about being an entrepreneur or an investor, we're in the pattern matching business, right? I mean, that's really, like people always ask me, how do I make money? And the answer is, well, the most successful investors, the most successful entrepreneurs are those who understand a pattern. They know what fits they, about their competition, about their customers. They know what's missing. They know what they can fill in. So I'm going to ask you five questions. I want you to write down the answers. No one's going to check the score. Uh, there's an extra credit question, and there's a prize for the person who gets all six questions right. Question number one, crowdsourcing is very much in vogue right now. And one of the most successful early stage crowdsource, crowdfunding sites is called Circle Up. You can submit your business plan. doesn't matter what it is. It could be a cosmetics company, a technology company, a restaurant. doesn't matter. And if the business plan is put up on Circle Up, people really do syndicate over the internet and invest in these companies. As an example, I just did a screenshot. This cosmetic company raised a million dollars on Circle Up. How many companies that submit their business plans to Circle Up end up on the site? So it's a curated site. There are people at Circle Up who make a judgment about the quality of the business plan, and then they put that business plan up. What percentage of the submitted business plans go on Circle Up? Next question. So you can't really have a tech presentation these days without talking about Bitcoin. I am not going to talk about it. I'm glad to answer questions during the Q&A. This will run about 35 minutes and then maybe, oh, you're awesome. Thank you. Oh. Two days ago, I told my wife that I was going to be giving a keynote squeak because I had bronchitis, so thank you. Um, so we'll, we'll do this for about 35 minutes, about 10 minutes of questions. Happy to answer Bitcoin questions then. Um, how many competitors are there? How many entrepreneurial competitors are there in the Bitcoin space? Not around creating different cryptocurrencies, but around trying to service the Bitcoin ecosystem. So reporting, banking, <clears throat> e-commerce. How many entrepreneurial startups are in this competitive ecosystem? Question number three. How many outstanding arrest warrants are there in the city of New York? Now, this is important. Question number four. This is a scary graph. So basically what this graph describes, I apologize to the people on this side of the room. I'm going to use a laser printer over here, a laser pointer, I'm sorry. But, so what this graph describes is um, how much your life expectancy decreases after a heart attack depending on how long it takes to be defibrillated. So as you can see, you want your life, you want the first responder to respond within five minutes. That's a big deal. And after, after five minutes, you can see the likelihood of survival goes way down. What's the response time to a heart attack in New York City on average by a first responder? So just write it down. And what's the response time in the country of Israel? It's a two-part question. New York City, Israel. There's a philosophy that I'm sure many of you in a framework 
that a lot of you are familiar with called The Lean Startup. And there's a lot of material on this, and there are books and websites. I'm not going to describe The Lean Startup, except to say that one of the anchor foundational concepts within The Lean Startup is MVP. What does it stand for? And it's not most valuable player. And here's the extra credit question. This tortilla machine was handmade in Los Angeles and shipped to New York City. How much does it cost to make a tortilla machine and ship it to New York City? That's the extra credit question. Okay, I want to start in this pattern matching discussion with capital raising. And I, had, I thought the panel, Eric, ran, I mean, it was a great panel today. I spent the entire hour, I learned a ton, and I, I, you know, there was a lot of insight that I thought was extremely valuable. Um, I'm just curious, just show, does someone want to blurt out an answer? How, what percentage of companies that submit their business plans to circle up? Just someone throw out a number. 20%. How many? 20%. 20%. How many people think it's more, 20% or more? It's a show of hands. Okay, so most people think it's less. The answer is 2%. Now, how can this be? Like, what's going on? Like, the whole premise of this site, come to us and you will get funded, and they only accept 2%. Well, here's why. These are the harsh, and by the way, I've got some very optimistic statistics after this, but these are the hard, this is the harsh reality of the world that I occupy. This was a study done by Harvard Business School of 2,000 companies over a decade, all entrepreneurial startups. Only 1.3% of those companies went public. And less than 9% were either merged or acquired. What this says is that 90% of the entrepreneurial companies that professional investors invest in do not return capital. And that's the going in assumption. So when someone who knows what they're doing looks at a business plan, it's not, wow, this is the best thing I've ever seen. It's like, my default assumption is 9 out of 10 aren't going to make it. Now, let me give you a little nuance in this 90% here. Um, of that 90%, 40% went out of business a complete 100% loss, and 50% of those are still in business but haven't returned any capital. So I don't want to be completely pessimistic about this. More importantly, though, there's been this emergence, which everyone in this room is familiar with. There are about 700,000 new companies started in the United States every year, and this is everything from a gas station to a restaurant to a cosmetics company to an iPhone app business. Um, and look at these two numbers. I'll read them because I think they're a little hard to read from the back of the audience. The first is friends and family. $60 billion is raised from friends and family every year. And by the way, this, this, the source of this is there's a, from the Venture Capital Association, so these are well-vetted numbers. And the, um, the next is angel investors, which you know, everyone in this room is familiar with. And $21 billion comes from angel investors. So the reason that um, venture capitalists and professional investors are not a good place to start is because these numbers have a lower hurdle rate, less demand, the terms for the capital are less onerous. There are a lot of reasons why these are the capital sources that are, I think, more realistic to tap. And, you know, I was surprised. I didn't know much about the Michigan um, venture and investment community. And, of course, I learned a lot, and I learned how vibrant it is. So, not surprisingly, you know this. There's a lot of capital now available for the people in this room in Michigan. So I did some research, and here's what I discovered. There are 25 incubators in Michigan. That's amazing to me. And I met uh, two of the incubators out in the room, and uh, they were really interesting. I asked one of them, I said, how much money did you raise last year for absolute seed startup businesses? And she told me $5 million, which I thought was fantastic. Remember, the average, uh, if you remember the slide before, the average angel investment totals $347,000. So that's a great number. The only other thing I want to point out, there are 25 VC firms in Michigan. That's very vibrant and very rich, but there are eight formal angel funds. So it says that there's a lot of percolating opportunity around capital that I didn't realize when I prepared this. And of course, I was, I was in a meeting with Lloyd Blankfein. At, it was really interesting. He was bragging, I think for good reason, about what Goldman Sachs is doing in Detroit. So you know, they're trying to help 10,000 small businesses in Detroit. They're really serious about this, and they've put a lot of money behind it. So again, I think there's a great opportunity. I want to talk to you about my first entrepreneurial hero and what he told me about, what he taught me about capital raising. So this is Charles Best. 
Uh, Charles was a Bronx school teacher who started DonorsChoose.org. Each of you got a DonorsChoose.org giving card courtesy of ACE, and I'm, I'm deeply appreciative. So let me tell you uh, what Donors Choose is so you know why I hope you'll use the free money that ACE gave you. There are few times in history when the saying, we're all in this together, would be more applicable than right now. Charles Best, he came up with a revolutionary idea during lunch in the teacher's lounge. My colleagues and I were talking about books that we wanted our students to read, field trips we wanted to take them on, art supplies that we needed, but these ideas wouldn't go beyond the teacher's lunchroom. And then I just figured that there were people from all walks of life who wanted to help improve our public schools. Through Donors Choose, ordinary citizens can directly fund projects initiated by enterprising public school teachers. Teachers request dictionaries, science kits, field trips, resources that their students need to thrive. Then you can give to the project request that most inspires you with a donation of any amount. And DonorsChoose.org delivers the materials to the school. It's such a simple, wonderful idea. It connects individual donors with individual classrooms and individual teachers and individual projects. You know exactly who you're helping and how you're helping them. It's tough getting a dollar. I don't like to give them all away, so... If I do, I'd like to know where it's going. When I started teaching last year, I didn't have any books for my students. It put the supplies in my classroom within two weeks. An art class in the Bronx had no paintbrushes, and now every single student has a set. You took a picture from the beginning of the year, and now it's like empty and full. <laughs> You as a donor can expect to get photographs of the activity taking place, student thank you notes, a teacher impact letter, illustrating, proving the impact that you've had. The thank you cards from the children are awesome. I love, because I, I love to give and know that I, I have a connection. Get you right, right there. It's a, a very easy way to give back to public schools. And I think that takes the best of what the internet offers, an ability for people to self-organize around communities of shared concern. This is exactly the kind of social innovation we should be encouraging across this country. I love DonorsChoose.org, and it's why I'm on the board, and why I'm committed to helping it in any way I can. Make sure you check it out, DonorsChoose.org. Let's not underestimate the power each of us has to change the world for someone. This is the first time I've ever disclosed this in public. Um, at the beginning of our um, incredible experience of trying to build donors choose, we had a donor who was willing to give us $600,000. And that was an amazing amount of money for us then. We really needed it. And of course, we took the money. And uh, we realized pretty shortly afterwards that the strings attached to that money, we had not really been honest with ourselves about what the implications were. And of course, the donor sort of heard what they want to hear here, and we heard what we want to hear here. And um, it became very clear that we were in trouble and that we were not going to satisfy the objectives of our largest single donor and that the money um, was really important to us. But Charles, and I think one of the most courageous decisions and at the time, I think he was 27, uh, he returned the money because he realized he could not achieve his entrepreneurial vision of what Donors Choose could be with those strings attached. And so the lesson I learned from that, and, I, and Eric, actually, the, I thought the, the way it was described on your panel was even better, right money, right time. But uh, today there are, uh, for Donors Choose alone in Michigan, 483 projects that have been posted by Michigan school teachers. So each one of you can take that Donors Choose card and you can have direct impact in Michigan. So Donors Choose has about 10, we've served about uh, over 10 million students. We're raising about a million dollars a week online. Uh, we have 60 employees and we've raised $225 million. We have about, uh, uh, about 1.3 million donors. All, I believe, because Charles said no to the money that would have led us down the wrong path. Right money, right time. Yeah, don't, uh, thank you. Clap for him, not me. He's the one who had the courage. Okay, how many, now I want to move on. So pattern matching. So the first one was about capital raising. I want to move on to competition. Uh, how many competitors are there in this Bitcoin ecosystem that's growing up? Just throw out a number. Thousand. Thousand. Okay, that's actually a pretty good guess. That, I'm not exactly sure. So I found this map. Now, here's what 
always amazes me, and it happened today as I was circling through your exhibit hall. You ask someone about competition, and generally, we get two answers. Generally, the answer is either, oh, we're totally unique, there's no one like us, or the answer is, oh yeah, I've got a competitor, but they're no good. Now, if someone came to me and asked about investing in Bitcoin, and they said, I've got a great idea for a Bitcoin business, I would take them, I would show them this, and I'd say, I want you to explain what every single company on this chart does, and remember the pattern matching? I want you to show me where you fit and why your fit is unique. So it, that's hard. And I think that many entrepreneurs, because it's hard and because you've got a lot of things on your mind, tend not to focus as much on the competition as they should. And I think that's true of investors, too. And, you know, it was really funny. I, I went to Northwestern, as you know. And um, <clears throat> this is Northwestern in Michigan playing football last year. And... Uh, you know, college coaches never denigrate their competition. They just don't do it. You never hear a college coach badmouth the competition. They, you know, I think in athletics we've all learned that there's just no value to that. And so I sort of came up with this, like, this concept, dignify your competition. And that's, I think, the second pattern is when an entrepreneur dignifies their competition, you know, my meter goes way over to green on that. And I will tell you that I met a great entrepreneur out in the room, and he dignified his competition. It was great. Um, oh, and by the way, you know, look, I know it's a huge long shot for this year. I get that. But there is some chance that Michigan could beat Northwestern this year. I just want to go on record. So. Okay, how many arrest warrants in the city of New York? Yeah, no, it's an amazing number. 1.5 million. I actually didn't believe it. I checked to make sure the number. I just didn't believe the number. And here's why. The police department in New York City is extremely effective, but they use very antiquated systems. And as we all know, those systems don't talk to each other. I and mean, we've all dealt with this in our own lives of old legacy stovepipe systems. So it's very hard if someone moves or changes their name or even plants just a little bit of false information. It's very hard for the police to actually sort through that. So um, this is Nick Selby. Nick Selby's a technologist, and he had a really, I thought, pretty simple idea. He said, why don't I create a dashboard where I take all this legacy data and I just basically present it in an integrated fashion at all the addresses that someone's lived at with a Google map link, all the aliases, which seems pretty straightforward. He could, and by the way, this is his vision of what that would look like. And it kind of is a pretty modern interface, but all it's doing is drawing data. He couldn't get anyone to pay attention to him and he would go to policemen, and he would go to police agencies, and he would say, I've got this great idea, and they would just totally ignore him. How come? Because he had no law enforcement experience. His passion did not match his experience. So what did Dick do? He went to the police academy. And he is now a police officer. And, you know, I call that matching experience to passion. And I will tell you, when he was making his pitch, I'm lucky enough to be an investor in Nick's company. And when he was making his pitch, and he's telling me this, and I'm listening, you know, and it's like, an, oh, like, oh, 90% of everyone's going to fail. And then, you know, he goes, oh, yeah, and by the way, I went to the police academy. And at the end, I said, I'm going to invest. And he said, wow, that was a quick decision. How come? And I said, because you had me at the police academy. So remember, matching experience to passion is really important. Again, I met another entrepreneur out in the room, and I don't want to mention any names, but he has deep, deep, deep technical expertise in something I know nothing about. But wouldn't you agree, Fred, that when we met him, his expertise matched his passion in a way that I found pretty unique? He's also a Northwestern grad. Um, next question. What is the average first response time in the city of New York? You have a heart attack, you call 911, how long is, on average, an ambulance going to take? Ten minutes. Exactly right. Ten minutes. So it's a little scary. State of Israel? Three minutes. In the entire country, how can this be? It can be, ooh. Um, so in Israel, there's a guy, I, these slides got out of order. This is my entrepreneurial hero. So this is Eli Beer. He actually saved the life of that infant that day. And he invented this system, a smartphone app. He didn't know anything about writing smartphone apps, but he invented a smartphone app where basically 2,000 first responders who are all volunteers in the country if someone calls 911 in Israel, 
Every, the smartphones, the 10 smartphones that are closest to the incident light up, and the first three people who respond are obligated to respond to the accident. It has been an unbelievable success. They literally had a guy having a heart attack in a hotel room, and there was someone down the hall in another room who responded to the smartphone call and was there within seconds. So Ellie's kind of incredible insight for me was he took a really hard problem. A hard problem, frankly, he had no competition. But he realized that if he could solve this problem, there'd be so much demand for his product. And um, he was honored at Davos, and he's got a number of countries now trying to buy his software. It's a for-profit software business, and he's got a very significant demand. He is an entrepreneurial hero of mine. What does MV, probably a lot of people know it, right? What does MVP stand for? Minimum viable products. So that's a kind of a concept behind um, the lean startup. So a lot of people think of minimum viable product as a tech concept. And, you know, kind of like, well, I got to get my smartphone app out or my, um, my application out, and then it'll just, uh, we'll, we'll continue to refine it. So this is Jessamine Waldman. So Jessamine is in the most pedestrian of businesses. She is a baker. She does. And her bakery bakes bread. And she understood that her minimum viable product for being a baker was a large commercial sustainable contract. Like she, she got that she could continue to sell small quantities of bread to local farmers markets, but she needed a really deep anchor customer. And it turned out in New York City, the Chipotle contract for tortillas came up for bid. So what did Jessamine do? She did not lose focus on her minimum vial product. She raised, how much? So how much does it take to have a tortilla? See, she knew, and she pitched investors and donors on the following. If I can get a tortilla machine, I know I can win this Chipotle contract. What's a tortilla machine cost? 100000 Exactly right. Good. Mark that as a correct on your sheet. Um, so here was interesting. When she talked about it, it wasn't, I need $100,000 for all the things I want to do. She's like, no, this is the pivotal decision in this business. If I can do this, I win. So she won the Chipotle contract. She won the Best Small Business Award by the Bloomberg administration. There were 1,500 entrants. And this year, she won a Clinton Global Initiative Award because she now employs 80 immigrant women working two full-time shifts to serve the demand now because, of course, what happened after Chipotle? She won Whole Foods, and you, you can imagine. And by the way, this is Hot Bread Kitchen today. So these are my entrepreneurial heroes. Jessamine, understanding, even in a business as simple as a bakery business, that there's a minimum viable product. And Ellie, who took an incredibly hard problem and figured out that flash mobs could solve his problem. And Nick, who said, I've got the passion, but I don't have the experience. I'm going to go get the experience, because if I do, people will fund my passion. And lastly, Charles, who said, not all dollars are the same, right money, right time. I want to change gears now and finish with a conversation about the boundary conditions, the sea captain and our friend Mr. Huskinson, because I thought it might help for you to understand where I think the really great fortunes are going to be made. They're not going to be made in the bakery business. They're not going to be made in the law enforcement business. They're not going to be made in the online education business. But um, this is where I think the really great fortunes are going to be made. Oh, and, the, and they're not going to be made in the rescue business in Israel. I mean, those are all going to be great businesses. Um, so I want to talk to you about what I see as the emerging boundary conditions. And I'm not going to suggest that you give up your day job or that you retrain yourself. I just want to give you a sense of we're going to see fantastic fortunes get made in the following five areas. And I'm doing this at a very macro strategic level, not in a specific business level. So this will be different from, I think, the way you've heard it before. This is the single most important slide in this entire presentation. So the top line here, this uh, vertical white line here, that's Moore's Law. And we have all clearly benefited from Moore's Law. Simply put, computer power doubles every 18 months. Got that. It's been unbelievable. This bottom line, the funny looking jagged line, is what it costs to sequence DNA. And that cost 
is uh, reducing at an order of magnitude 10 times faster than Moore's Law. So if you read the bottom, in the year 2000, when the first person was sequenced, it cost $3 billion and took 10 years. And in 2013, uh, you can get your genome sequenced in Boston now at Partners Health for $9,000. It takes 16 weeks. And we kind of, I'm sorry, what? Which is it? Okay, thank you. So, so this is frankly why I love giving these talks. I did not know that, so thank you. And so I was just told that it's now down from 9,000 to 1,000. One th right, from 9 to 1. Thank you very much. So that, I'm sorry, i got to go change my slide here. <laughs> I'll change the slide afterwards. Thank you. Um, so uh, we could go into it. We could have a whole conversation about personalized medicine and genomics. I just want to plant the seed that everyone in this room, this will be the most profound effect that you see in your lifetime. You need to learn about it. Are there ways to make money off it? There are going to be unbelievable fortunes made here. Is it complicated? Yes. Do you all need to become molecular biologists? No. But there's incredible opportunity. Now I want to talk about demographics. So I was thinking about preparing this presentation, and I realized if you look at those, uh, that map of the, of the companies the great companies, a lot of them were driven by demographics. And if you think about all the really great fortunes that have been made, many of them were demographics. If you look at the oil and railroad fortunes that really drove because people were going to the West, if you look at what's happening in China today, these are all demographically driven. And to make this point, and by the way, this book, I'm not recommending this book in particular, it happens to be a very good book, uh, it's just that I chose it because it was written by Michigan professors, but there are you know, countless books on demographics. So how many people here know what WhatsApp is? Show of hands. Okay, this is the most important application in the world. And look at the numbers. WhatsApp, this literally today, there were more WhatsApp messages sent than SMSs in the entire world. And yet, I think I saw 20 hands go up. And why? Because this company has grown to 350 million users in like under a year. So, and who's driving it? Teenagers. You can't find a teenager who doesn't know about WhatsApp. And the, uh, just so you know, I'll just describe it quickly. WhatsApp is a texting application where you can send text messages over the internet from any device to any device over using any carrier. So you're not reliant on your cell phone minutes. So I have friends in Israel, friends in China, friends all over the world. We all WhatsApp each other all the time because it's free. It's an amazing application. But it's totally driven by demographics. I'll have a resource at the end on demographics. Uh, we've got two more. Uh, the next one is uh, a company called Innocentive. Now, there are a lot of, how many, I'm curious, how many people here have an engineering or technical background? So, yeah, like half the room. So, uh, how many people here know what Innocentive is? Like four people. Okay, that's good. Um, Innocentive is a, a website where corporations post bounties to solve really hard problems. They can be engineering problems, biology problems, chemistry problems, IT problems. Um, and then the corporations guarantee that in return for them owning the intellectual property, they will pay you. They've paid out $40 million to 1,500 people so far from all over the world. And so the reason I bring this up, this is yet another form of capital raising for people in this room who have, you have unique skills. And the fact is there's someone out there who's willing to pay you a lot of money if your skills happen to match their needs. Um, this is a site called Prosper. Now, Prosper, uh, the reason I'm putting it up is not because of Prosper's business model, which I'll describe in a second. It's because of the disintermediation that's continuing to take place on the Internet. So disintermediation, simply put, is taking out a middleman that doesn't add any value anymore. The record companies got decimated by the digital music business. Netflix took out Blockbuster. We all understand what disintermediation is. So basically, the way Prosper works and this is peer-to-peer -peer lending, and there are many sites that do this. I'm not endorsing Prosper. I'm just saying that borrowers can come to Prosper and say, I want to borrow money on an unsecured basis, and lenders can lend them money on an unsecured basis. Fred, if I'm correct, a billion dollars this year in new origination? What? I don't know. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't mean to put you on the spot. I know Lending Club is going to do a billion dollars of new origination. So get this, look at these numbers. If you lend money on Prosper, you average a return of just over 9%. That's not bad. 
And if you borrow money and you're a really high quality borrower, you can borrow money at 6%. So if you've got 30% credit card debt and you can find someone who's willing to lend you money, that's a pretty good spread. Well, um, the uh, reality of this is that it is a wildly successful business. But the reason I bring it up is not because of peer-to-peer -peer lending as a specific business, but more as the concept that we've just begun to see the beginning of disintermediation. And the last one, and the best one, and the one that needs to be saved for last, is big data. So show of hands, how many people are sick of hearing the words big data? Yeah, OK. Other show of hands, how many people here really know what big data is? OK, well, that's better than me, because I don't really know what it is, but OK. So using it is the hardest part. So here's the thing. We're, we're obviously accumulating massive amounts of data. But the secret is in the use of the data. And what I will argue for the people in this room and where the opportunity lies is in an engineering term called signal-to-noise ratio. So think about your inbox, right? We're all completely... St I, I once recently said that the only thing that stresses people more than health is their inbox. Because we don't, you know, it's just overwhelming, right? The volume's overwhelming. We don't know what to answer when. It's terrible. Well, the fact is, if someone can improve the signal-to-noise ratio, if someone can help me identify those emails that matter more, I'll pay them a lot of money. On my DVR, if there's a way to sequence the stuff I really love versus all the junk, which we're getting better at doing, that's improving signal-to-noise. And so I want to conclude on these boundary conditions with this soldier on the right. So look at that device he's got. That device is a single purpose device to increase his signal to noise. Now, his life and the life of his fellow soldiers depends on it, but here's the really interesting point. There's a lot of noise in that environment, but there is incredible signal if you can find it. And I will tell you that someone in this room is gonna make a lot of money in some business, probably one I don't even understand, by improving the signal to noise ratio using big data. So I don't talk about big data anymore. When someone talks to me, I've got this great big data idea, and there was someone out there who had a big data idea in your exhibition hall. My question is, well, no, I want to hear how you're going to improve the signal to noise in that data. And if they've got a well-formed answer, again, my meter goes all the way to green. So in conclusion, if you could read one thing about this talk that I think summarizes the pattern matching and the boundary conditions, it would be a memo that Bill Gates wrote in 1995. So let's think about where Microsoft was in 1995, one of the wealthiest corporations on earth, could do no wrong, right? I mean, the business was booming. So I highlighted the only sentences that matter. Now, you should read the whole memo. Uh, in the next 20 years, now remember, 1995 he wrote this, in the next 20 years, the improvement in computer power will be outpaced by the exponential improvements in communication networks. The combination of these elements will have a fundamental impact on work, learning, and play. Now, this is not about Microsoft and whether they succeeded in making the shift. It's about Bill Gates, the map maker. It's about him looking over the edge of the world and realizing that Microsoft would fall off the edge of the world if you didn't see it. Well, these disruptive opportunities are there in a lot of the businesses that you know as well. So here are some resources that I use to prepare this talk. Um, Deep Survival is a fantastic book about boundary conditions. I cannot recommend it highly enough. If you're interested in signal and noise and really going a little deeper on this question of big data, there's a new book out by Nate Silver, who, by the way, called every single congressional district in the United States correctly during the last election cycle, uh, called The Signal and the Noise. So that's pretty self-explanatory. Uh, here's an article that was in Foreign Affairs. You can download this on the web for free. By the way, I'm going to put this presentation up. Uh, can we put it on the ACE website so people don't have to, because no one's going to be able to write that fast. So um, uh, this is an article on the really big demographic changes that are going to affect us all globally. Uh, this is, my opinion, by far the best blog for entrepreneurs and investors on the internet. I read it religiously every day. Everyone in my community reads it religiously every day. It's called AVC. It's Fred Wilson's blog. I cannot recommend it highly enough. You will learn something new every day you read this blog. It's an unbelievable, because of the contributors that, that contribute to it, as well as Fred's great insights. If you're interested in that molecular biology and really trying to get your hands around what it's going to mean for your own health, for the health of your family, and really for global society, there's a book called Regenesis. 
highly recommend it. Some of the reading's really tough. I didn't understand some of it because it's deep molecular biology. There was other stuff that I couldn't put down. It was so fascinating. So I would say you're safe in skipping the stuff you don't understand and you'll still appreciate the book. He, by the way, is an interesting experiment, said he wanted more copies of the book than any other book printed in history. So what did he do? He coded the book in DNA and then he replicated the DNA in a test tube. So in a test tube that size, he created 40 billion copies of the book. And then the last and my favorite, this is the best book on business I've ever read. It's called Why Smart People Make Big Money Mistakes. And if every person in this room read that book, I guarantee you'd either, I can't guarantee you'd make a lot of money, but I can guarantee you'd lose less. So I started in the 15th century and I'm going to end in the 15th century. You're all map makers. Some of you know it. Some of you don't, but all of you have the ability to see something over the horizon that others don't and then make a decision as to whether you want to profit from it or not. If you choose not to, it's my understanding that the British are looking for a new Secretary of State for War in the Colonies. Thank you very much. Thanks. I went a little over my time, so I think we only have about five. Do we have any time for questions, or should we just cut it off? Five? Okay. If anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Oh, yeah, that's intimidating. Does anyone have any questions? If not, we can call it a night. I think it's hot and people are... T I'm sorry, what? Yeah. Yeah, the book for Genesis. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry, I should have explained this. What it does is it allows me to find out your unique biology so that I can tailor treatments. And in fact, now cancer treatments, there are many cancer treatments now, quite successful, where they will actually take part of the tumor out, they will use these techniques, and then they will actually train the, in this case, monoclonal antibody, but doesn't matter, the drug to attack that tumor. And that can only be done because of this technology. So the, the days of just bombing with chemo and this kind of, we're going to kill everything, that's still today, unfortunately, the standard of practice. In 10 years, when it's so cheap, right now, it's, even at $1,000, it's too expensive for someone to sequence and get that whole map. And we don't yet understand what that map means. But in 10 years, we're really going to understand it. And we're going to be able to treat a lot of conditions not just cancer, diabetes and other things, in ways that we, can't, we literally cannot envision yet. So here's how it works. You literally, no joke, you swab the inside of your cheek with a Q-tip. You take that swab, which has some human cells, you put it in a test tube, they mail it off, they've got this big bank of machines, and back comes a CD that has the whole thing. It's completely non-invasive as long as you're willing to scrape your cheek. Yes. How are you doing? I'm just good. First, I have to do a mic check. Is everything working well? Uh, yeah. Okay. I wanted to uh, bring up something that hopefully uh, someone here can it'll light a spark in in someone here because we have a great audience here. I, I wanted to know, and it, and it goes back to the the Israel when yep. the, the situation Ellie in Beer. Israel. Yep. Um, there are fantastic ideas throughout the world that aren't being utilized here in the United States. Correct. And there's no mechanism to um, aggregate these ideas, see if there can be some intellectual property that's transferable to our country so that we can, we can benefit from everyone's uh, knowledge. And it just seems like it's such a waste because uh, there's nothing worse than going to another country and finding out you're not the best. Yeah. I know, it's true. So first of all, it's a fantastic point. I completely agree. Uh, let me say two things. One is, I believe Innocentive is a canary in the mine for that. Remember that map? There are a lot of people from outside the United States that were coming to this site, primarily American companies, to solve their problems. So I would say that it's starting. But I think something else really positive is happening, and that is there are a number of philanthropists, a number of entrepreneurs who have made a lot of money, who understand what you are talking about and are really working hard to try and solve that in communications, in health, in hunger. And I would say slowly, 
America is starting to open its eyes to the reality that you're describing? I don't have the easy answer. I will say, though, that I'm seeing pinpricks of success. Ellie's a great example, right? Oh, and by the way, he can't get anyone in the United States to pay attention, but he's got all these countries all over the world, India and Argentina and Venezuela. They're like all over it. They're like, yeah, we want this. So yeah, it's a really hard slog, and he's frustrated by that, but he's just moving on. He's not stopping. So does that sort of answer your question? So why don't we take one more and we'll call it a night? Yeah. What's your passion? Uh, so... <laughs> Um, the question is, what's my passion? And my passion right now is helping wounded veterans, and I spend as much time and money and resources as I possibly can. I think the, the crisis in the United States that we're about to face, it, no one can really fathom, and I've been lucky enough to meet some veterans who have really inspired me. So all I will say is, if you really want to understand how um, bad the problem is, there's a book by David Finkel called Thank You for Your Service, and it, you will never forget this book if you read it. So thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Have a good night. How about another round of applause for Peter's wonderful presentation? I think a few of you may be confused about the um, gift card that uh, may have been in your name badge. You might want to look behind your name tag. You may see that you have this orange card. This is your DonorsChoose.org card that is a gift to you from ACE. It is already loaded with $10 in it. All you have to do is go to the Donors Choose site and browse through and find a, an opportunity to invest your $10 to help a teacher with their project. So the reason why we have given you this is because we really want to be sure you're aware of this organization, how it works, and this gives you a little practice opportunity. So please, if you... Um, if you'd like, you can use it before you even leave here today. We have some computers set up at the registration table. Um, we have people there that can help walk you through it, and you can uh, take care of your $10. If you don't use it um, tonight before you leave, please use it at home. It's ready to go, and uh, feel free to contribute more than $10.